So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another Q&A. As always, if you want to get your question answered, very, very simple. All you have to do is just turn on post notifications and somewhere randomly throughout the week, I go ahead and post a um, little YouTube post thing uh, asking for some questions and I pick some within the first one to two hours. So let's go ahead and get into it. question number one is do you ever play video games what's your opinion on being an entrepreneur and playing video games uh, i don't personally play video games i remember when i moved into my old place this is almost three years ago at this point um i got a ps4 because i was like all right cool you know if my friends come over we can play some fifa and whatnot i think that got used maybe like four or five times ever yeah i don't know it's just not really my thing and i think video games can be very very dangerous because there's no like start and end and what i mean by that is like even if you know sometimes uh, to relax i'll watch netflix and the issue with that is uh, if I get into a, re and this is kind of my Achilles heel, if I get into a really good documentary, like I love documentaries, um, and especially Netflix, a lot of time with these documentaries, uh, they can have really like intense cliffhangers. The issue with that is, you know, and you were intending on just watching something for 45 minutes or an hour, and then now, you know, you want to watch the next thing and the next thing. Um, so I think, you know, movies are even a lot safer in a lot of senses uh, rather than uh, TV shows or documentaries or, uh, uh, anything like that and I think it's kind of the same thing with video games is like you know once you finish that game you want to play an another one or hit that next you know however video games work or whatever video game you're playing um, so I think it'd be very very dangerous so just as a general rule as an entrepreneur I'd stay away from video games I don't really know any uh, personally su very successful entrepreneurs that like heavily play video games and just in general to be honest I think there's much better ways to relax and unwind yeah I just think video games are can be very very, very stressful uh, and can really take a toll on you. Uh, you know, I've just got in my mind replaying like people who play like Call of Duty or like uh, Fortnite. I think it, it, Fortnite and what's the other one that's like popular now? I don't know. Like, the point is, I, I've, I, in my mind, I've got these games uh, and like they just seem super, super stressful to me and just like make me seem like you want to uh, just throw your controller against the wall or, or smash your computer against the wall. So. <laughs> I don't know in terms of ways to relax and kind of unwind, I definitely don't think that's the best route to go. If you want to play video games, that's up to you. But um, I also just think it's very dangerous in terms of uh, it just jacks your dopamine up. Yeah, I, I would just avoid it if, if I were you. Next question is, when do you think that Facebook slash Instagram ads will die? I'm talking about the platform, not the business model. Uh, it depends in some niches and sub niches. Um, it kind of has died already. For example, um, with our info product clients, there's certain markets, price points, and industries where cold ads just don't really work on Facebook or Google anymore. For example, any of our clients that have um, e-commerce education companies or um, yeah, uh, e-commerce, FBA, uh, agency, like consulting, that sort of stuff, cold doesn't work at a certain price point. Uh, for example, agency incubator, it does not work on cold at a certain price point uh, using Facebook and Google ads. It just doesn't and no one, I know for a fact over the last year and a half, two years, on using Facebook ads, there is not a single person who has managed to make cold ads work on Facebook and you know Facebook and Instagram for a uh, education company around agency, consulting, e-commerce, that sort of stuff above like a 50% margin. And when you take into consideration all the other aspects of the business, a 50% margin, you know, to spend 100K and make 150K sounds nice. When you take into consideration merchant fees, the operating costs of the businesses and all the other deductible stuff from there, as well as the fact that a lot of time the tracking can be very off. It's just not worth it. So I guess my point is, uh, I think with certain industries, it's already too hyper competitive, but that's just a very specific one that comes to mind, uh, obviously because of the industry that I'm in and you know the fact that 80% of our clients are info product clients, but for e-commerce businesses, for local businesses, for all that sort of stuff, uh, Facebook ads still work totally fine. And I mean, at the end of the day, all of the advertising platforms, whether you're advertising on Snapchat, whether you're advertising on Pinterest, whether you're advertising on LinkedIn, uh, Facebook, Google, it doesn't really matter you know the only way i can describe it is for example you know shooting sony compared to canon you know at the end of the day you still know how to use a camera you know you might have to figure out the dials they might be a little different and the menu system may be a little different but at the end of the day you're still shooting a camera and it's the same thing with advertising platforms facebook and instagram are still very very effective for 95 percent of industries and the day that they're not you switch over to whichever platform is the best for example as i said for specific and this is probably only like 20 percent of our clients youtube slash google ads make far more more sense than Facebook ads. You know, it's like going from shooting Sony to Canon, you know, it's, it's all really the same thing.
Next question is, is there still a large enough e-commerce market to support the growing number of agencies in the niche? Do you think e-com is beginning to get oversaturated with agencies and hard to break into as a new business? I, I don't think so at all. I mean, first of all, you gotta think, the e-commerce market is so big. And then the other thing that you're starting to see especially in the last six months is traditional businesses. You know, we literally just brought on a client a couple days ago that's doing 150K a month, but as a traditional brick and mortar shop in Italy, and now they're trying to go online. And you're seeing that all across the board, a lot of these brick and mortar businesses are now pivoting and, and either starting e-commerce branches and e-commerce arms to their business, or they're just putting a lot more focus into it. And that is a huge, huge market. The other thing that I'd say is you need to understand we're in this echo chamber. So if you're watching this, you're in entire, not your entire life, but you know, you go on your YouTube subscription box and it's like stuff about agency and stuff about business. And maybe you're in a Facebook group or, you know, maybe you're inside of agency incubator or copy paste agency. And all you see are other agency owners. And you need to understand that we're a very small, small, tiny group of entrepreneurs and business owners in a massive, massive market. And you also need to understand for every agency owner that runs things the way that, you know, I teach you guys to run it. I teach you my programs, which is a small lean boutique agency that the, you know, literally makes 10 times more money than the traditional standard agencies because rather than 10 to 15% margins, which is that is actually the industry standard for agencies is, is 10 to 15% margins. Instead, we make anywhere from 65 to 90% margins. And we also focus on one thing. We focus on getting clients the best possible result by staying streamlined focused. You need to understand that for every one of us that there are, there's six other traditional slow agencies. And another thing you need to bear in mind is there are so many agencies out there that are getting there to be honest, I'd say fitting into the vast majority, which are those slow, really inefficient agencies. Most of them aren't getting their clients results. And it's such a breath of fresh air once they come and start working with an agency like ours. So that's the other thing. There's so much opportunity out there to poach clients and get them better results. But the last thing I will say is most people focus on e-commerce. I'm not sure why, especially because it's a hell of a lot harder than your local businesses. But you know, the thing I'd say is I would much rather be a big fish in a small pond in the realm of business rather than being a small fish in a big pond. I would much rather, you know, work in, in a weirder industry. For example, I have students in copy paste agency making 15, 20 K a month in the cannabis industry, making 10, 15 K a month in the solar industry in copy paste agency. I have students making 70, hundred, even 120 K a month profit running, for example, some of your more standard industries, for example, gyms or uh, real estate agents, but in different markets. So they run it locally in their own country. For example, Portugal, Serbia, Italy, Brazil, Mexico, Australia, the list goes on and on. So once again, they may be in some more popular industries, but they are the big fish because they're doing it locally within their market. So these are all things you need to kind of keep in mind and consider. But yeah, I'd leave you with that is when it comes to having an agency, I'd much rather be a big fish in a small pond rather than a small fish in a big pond. Next question is, is there a rule of thumb for determining when you have enough money to invest in real estate? Uh, I don't say, you know, I wouldn't say there's a rule of thumb. The only thing that I would say is as standard, you should have both personally and for the business. And that's the thing. If you're running an agency here, your fixed costs are, you know, are very, very little, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, a hundred dollars a month, maybe a couple hundred dollars a month for my agency on software. I think, you know, at this point we spend $300 a month, some, something preposterous, you know, all there is, is just G suite slash hello sign. And then a hundred dollars for click funnels, which I use for our website, our onboarding and pretty much anytime I'm doing any hiring. So I, you know, I use it kind of as a full stack thing. Really my point is for the business, you don't really need that much in cash reserve. And then for your contractor, your contractor only gets paid if you get paid. And then if you're at a point where you have some, a full-time employee, realistically, you're making 10, 15, 20 K a month anyways. So, you know, you don't have to worry if you lose even half your clients, you're still probably going to be profitable. So anyways, long story short, you should have six to nine months of your running costs as cash at any given point. And in my opinion, after that, the beautiful thing with the agency is because it's such a cash flow business, you can just kind of invest the rest. Uh, you know, I can't tell you what's right for you. All I can say is from next year, I'm literally taking 90% of my agency profits and investing that in real estate. The other thing you need to understand is the real estate is not going to give you, you know, F you money. Your business is the thing that will give you that F you money. What real estate will do is real estate will give you that sustainable long-term wealth and it will build something substantial financial for the future that you have for decades and decades to come. The other thing that you need to keep in mind with real estate, uh, if you have an agency is 
you don't want to be an active investor, you know, because if you're going to be an active investor, you know, real estate does take work. So for me, my goal is find below market deals, have some sort of value ads that I can add to it that are less than the increase in the value of the house. And then the beautiful thing from there is you can actually take out equity from that house. And a lot of times that can actually balance off the deposit that you paid for it. And then from there, you rent it out. Hopefully you're cash flowing. Even if you're not, it doesn't really matter because basically your renters are still basically paying for the amount of equity you have in the house to go up as well as you have uh, property prices increasing a whole bunch of tax benefits, et cetera, et cetera. Anyways, long story short for me, basically that's my plan. By the end of next year, I want to have 10 to 15 houses. I'm going to have a million pounds in equity in my property portfolio, probably with a value of two to 2.5 million obviously you know i'm a 20 year old so a lot of the houses i first buy probably the first house i do buy i'm gonna buy cash so i can just use as collateral and i can start getting better and better deals on interest rates etc etc plus it's always just and once you own a house wholeheartedly, as I said, that gives you a bit of buying power. But that's just me personally. I wouldn't recommend the same thing for someone who's 38 and, you know, has already bought a house or, or owns a house and they're paying it off and, you know, they have a long track record or whatever. I'm, the issue with me is I'm just still very young. So back to my point, if you want to accumulate your wealth as quickly as humanly possible, the best thing you can do is have a cash flow business like your agency and just take 80% of your monthly profits and go ahead and invest that and grow that long term. That's a very sensible thing to do. Now, realistically, once you start making 10 to 20k a month will you do that no probably you'll buy a car and you'll buy a watch um and you'll you know you'll enjoy yourself because at the end of the day you work harder in your business and you know i think a lot of time you, you need to get that out of your system uh, but for me now at this point in life uh the most exciting thing is just having my cash flow business, taking 80% of that, investing that into real estate and building wealth long, long term. Next question is ever looked at micro watch brands like Dan Henry? Um, no, I mean, I have a bunch of fun, quirky watches. For example, um, I have, I literally just ordered a Pulsar, a Mickey Mouse Pulsar. Tristan, if you could put a pop a photo somewhere here, it's like a, a vintage old watch. Uh, it's very like fun, cute watch. Uh, you know, I have, more fun cheap watches it's like it's the casio g-shock the one that looks like a royal oak it's like black once again tristan if you could pop a photo up here like it, it's got the you know the royal oak shape and it's black it's quite uh thin in compared to most g-shocks i have the timex q i believe it's a 1976 reissue once again tristan if you pop that up somewhere here so my point is like i have a bunch of like fun cute watches and a lot of time if you know i'll see a watch and it's you know less than 200 pounds or something and i just find it you know it sparks that childish delay in me, then, you know, a lot of time I'll get it. But in terms of spending like, uh, you know, and Dan Henry, I'm not sure how much that watch brand is. Um, I've heard of it before, but you know, I would never spend a grand or two grand or three grand on a, a watch brand that I don't, you know, really like. You know, I have a very extensive collection at this point in terms of, you know, having Richard Mills, um, having a, a few Pateks, a few APs, uh, lots of Rolexes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, from now on, in terms of my collection, I want to you know, build a few more, uh, have a few more staples in there. I'm getting a Jaeger Lukut uh, Grand Reverso. Um, you know, after that, uh, after that, I'm not really sure. But my point is, I think I'm going to get, you know, my watch collection, uh, collecting journey has just started, you know, probably over the next few years, I'm going to get more into quirky pieces and vintage pieces. Uh, I really want to get a Paul Newman Daytona. Um, I really want to get, for example, a 1970s, 1960s or 1970s um, Pepsi. Obviously, I'm wearing a, you know, a new one now. Uh, I'm wearing a 2019 that I got last year. I want to get one that it just has some like beautiful patina to it. And um, yeah, just has some beautiful patina on the bezel. Yeah, I, I think those are, that's kind of the direction I want to go with my watch collecting uh, with micro brands, maybe later down the line. But I am more interested in just getting quirky watches. Um, that's what I'd say. I like is that I like a lot of these watches for 100, 200, 300. Um, you know, there's a, I forget what watch brand it is, but there's a Russian watch brand that I really want to get. Another thing that I want to get is a watch where the serial number, I can tell that it was from um, January of 2000 or within that period. So that way, basically I know that uh, it was made around the same time that I was born. So yeah, that's uh, kind of what I, where I want to go in terms of my watch collecting. Um, but then again, who knows, to be honest, uh, maybe later down the line, I'll get into some of these more nuanced brands. Ladies and gents, hope you guys enjoyed that Q&A. That pretty much wraps it up. Down below, you'll go ahead and find the winner of the Gadget giveaway. As always, if you want to be drawn in to win, very, very simple. All you have to do is hit subscribe, turn on post notifications, and within the first two hours of the new video going live, just go ahead and leave a comment. And on that note, 
Hope you guys enjoyed. I'll see you in the next one.